Hello and welcome to this new series titled, Music Education, Why It Matters. In this program, I interview professional music educators and ask them five questions. Through these questions, it is my hope that all educators, students, and parents gain a deeper understanding of why music education matters and why it needs to be an integral part of the curriculum in our schools. I suspect that these questions asked and the answers given will impact each group differently and at different levels. For the educator watching, this program may offer a chance to reflect on what they are doing in their classroom every day. For the students, it may offer a better understanding of why they are learning this complex subject called music. And for the parents of these students, it may offer a glimpse into the pedagogical theories and teaching methods being used in your child's music classroom. It is my hope that this program is meaningful to the professional music educator, the parents of music students, and to the eager students that enter our music classrooms every day. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Peter Hopperman, Director of Bands at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. Enjoy. My name is Peter Haberman, and I'm the Director of Bands at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. I direct the Concordia Band, and I also work with the Echo Band. It's a third concert band, so I also have some student conductors that I get to teach conducting and rehearsal techniques with, and I also work with some music education courses as well. I grew up in the Twin Cities area and went to Centennial High School. I attended Concordia College, where I now teach. Um, I taught seven years in the public schools, 5-12 band, both places, three years in rural Minnesota, in Maple Lake, Minnesota, and four years in um, affluent suburban Seattle. And I also received a master's degree at the University of Montana and a doctorate at the University of Minnesota. I've been teaching teachers since 2008, 2009, wow. Um, so I taught out at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania and also at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire before now teaching here at Concordia. Hmm. So as I remember it, and it was my junior year, sophomore year of high school, there was a new band director that came to my school and suddenly everything in music changed. So I was probably going to be a doctor or a lawyer, and I was really interested in science and the persuasive arts, if you will, and um, then I started getting spine tingles every time I played the trumpet, um, and music suddenly meant something it had never meant before, and then I wanted to be a band director, and I've never looked back. I think before that happened, though, I had had an opportunity to be, opportunity to be in a countywide jazz band that met in the summers. It, um, we had singers and it was kind of like a variety show uh, opportunity and I was surrounded by other musicians like I had never seen before. So I'd had some opportunities before that, um, but I never saw myself in that role until Mike Lean was my band director and then it all changed. So the biggest challenge well, it's one of two things. I think the first one is the amount of contact time we get with students or how busy students are. To be a great basketball player, it takes a lot of time on the court and good coaching. And to be a great artist, it doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of intrinsic motivation is necessary, but I think time on task is important and I, I get nervous that the longer I see this the less and less time we have with students. So I, that's a big concern is that we keep um, foreign languages and music and, and things that take contact time on that specific topic part of the holistic education for our students in the schools. So that might be it. I also think well, one of the reasons why I left teaching in the public schools was I wanted to teach future teachers to do it well. And I think 
the best thing we can do is put the most qualified teachers out to that are great musicians but also great teachers of music motivating inspirational they understand how to teach the components of music well and I don't think we always do that I think there are people in our profession I'm sure there are people in every profession that uh, are below the bar but I see some teachers that are out there and I've seen this in every state um, that um, are doing a disservice actually to music teaching sometimes and um, it's rare but it's enough that I, w I want the best teachers to go out I want to influence a generation of great teachers to go out and do this well because that keeps music moving forward but there's a lot of things that pull us away from great teaching you know I mean Suzuki Gordon these people were dead a long time ago and yet we know that works right I, we're an, we, as a human, we follow, right? We copy people. So we need to hear a good sound to know how to make a good sound. And then, then we need to figure out the parts too, but we need to experience first. And I think we have a lot of people, you know, and then bands somehow became, you know, a guy with a pencil tapping on a thing in the 50s and 60s, whatever. And now we have to, you know, we give them an instrument. They have to hold an instrument. That's kinesthetic. They have to sit away. They have to connect it to their body in a way that feels weird. Now they have to read a foreign language, which is time sensitive. And none of this is um, instinctual. And we make them all do it at the same time. We know that students learn best when they do one thing at a time. And until they do the next thing, they have, they have to master that before they add on, right? Math is the same way. You have to have certain concepts before you can use them and apply them to others. And we want to make sure students have great fundamentals in math before we go to linear algebra and calculus, right? We spend years on the fundamentals. And we try to have a concert with fifth graders by October or December. We are not doing it the right way. And we know that from the education theory and how people learn, but we don't find a way to blend that with our school day. Old model. Uh, old model, and we, in older models that we knew before this model, we know that it's not right, but what do we do to make it right? And I think there's still ways to do that. I, I, I mean, I'll talk, when I saw Darcy Brandenburg teaching out at Central Cass when I first got here, he has the fifth grade. So he gets all the fifth graders, but he has all the fifth graders every day, but they're all together. So he's like, how am I going to teach fifth grade band with everybody in the room? Well, it takes a little while to get him started, but then he doesn't have them read. He sings, they play. This is Do. This is Ray. This is me. This is Do, this is Ray, this is me, right? This is Do, this is Ray. And he sings, they play, they play games, they learn by ear, then the students get to play something and everybody else has to copy it. Wonderful. And it's like he stumbled into this because he was forced into a non traditional starting. And yet, man, those kids can play. Why? Because they learn by ear ear and then they learn to read. We don't teach our three-year-old Shakespeare. We teach them the sounds and what the letters look like and they explore and take a long time to speak first and then they read. And I'm a huge proponent of reading. Of course, you know, we can, you know, exponentially decrease times, but one thing at a time until they're successful. I just spent the morning the last two mornings in public schools working with high school bands and I spent all of the time getting them to actually listen to each other instead of just read but it says forte yeah but don't ever make that sound like that's not how that works and I'm not a proponent of rote teaching but I'm a, a huge proponent of sound to symbol and if if we just all took a stand and decided that we are the professionals in music and we know how to teach music, no principal is going to stand in our way. And then when it's successful and the kids like it and they feel successful and they're good at it and they want to do it again, they don't go anywhere. They stay right there. They keep making band or choir 
or orchestra. And I think, and that's just, yeah, I think that's really important. I would do it differently. I did, I, you know, we all teach the way we were taught. That's the worst thing about this. We're taught different concepts of teaching by our college professors. But when the rubber meets the road, we do what we remember happened when we were in fifth grade or high school. And you have to gain your confidence to say, wait, this isn't working. There's got to be a better way. And that's, and that's okay. It is. That's tough to get there. You have to really stick it out. Yes. And take your bruises and put yep. the band-aids on your scrapes, and, but remember those and move on. Got to get back on the bike. And keep going. You know? Yeah, we learn more than our students for at least five years. Yeah. And that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. But then that's also why we go back for more education to realize, like, you know that it doesn't have to happen that way. And the great teachers, they, they find a way to blend the models in really successful ways. We need to create independent musicians that love expressing themselves through their instruments, be it their voice or their violin or their trumpet. Because if they find this as a way that they express themselves, they'll find their way back. And they also have to be independent so they know how to read, right? We just talked about that, but they need to know how to read well enough and have the confidence that they can do this with someone else. So, you know, in some ways I like the honor band components because they realize they can get together with other students from other schools. It's not just their band director and their school room. Um, and if they have those fundamentals that they can read and do this with other people and they still enjoy that, I think that sends them into communities. Um, my I never would see my success as a public school teacher based off of how many people became music majors. But my success was based off how many of them continued to make music when they went off to college, or even if they went and stayed in the community, played in the community band, sang in their church choir. That is success, right? That they continue making music after they're done with secondary school. I just think, but why don't they? Well, they don't read well. So they can't do that on their own, or they, need, they don't have the confidence that they can do it on their own. I think it's important we build that through solo and ensemble and chamber music and expectation that they can do that. Um, but then that our rehearsals are not, you need to have the fundamentals to be able to play well, but then you have, to, it's rare a student finds themselves in a place where they're expressive without being asked to be expressive. So I think my job as a conductor in an ensemble is to encourage and ask them to be expressive, not to play louder here, be softer there. You know, trumpet sets an F sharp. That's like lowest, con lowest common denominator conductor, right? They just don't do anything differently until I tell them. Whereas if we can rehearse in a way where we're asking questions, you know, can we, can we all hear the horn there? I know it says forte, but if you can't hear the horns, you're too loud. And horns, maybe be a bit more bold in how you say that. Now I'm getting them to listen. They've created the response in their music making rather than cross out the forte and make it mezzo forte. Just write in the word horn. Because then if we play in a gym and then the auditorium in a rehearsal room, as long as you can always hear the horn, you're doing the right thing. I think how we rehearse is important to keep them wanting to make music, that they have those experiences that connect them beyond the rhythm and the notes. Part of me wants to say that goes back to the biggest thing, the biggest issue in music education today is the fact that the teachers aren't teaching music in a way that creates these independent musicians so they can leave. Or doesn't connect the fact that music's part of our lives everywhere, right? You, you hear it all the time, it's on the radio. We don't connect what we're doing in our public school education maybe to the way they take in music or that they don't even notice that they're taking in music. 
I think that's I think that's part of that connection too. Like, there's nothing wrong with finding, you know, the whatever your school is doing for a musical, and that you draw all the students into the idea of musical theater and how powerful that can be um, as part of their experience for that year. Just like drawing them into uh, the beauty that's in a chorale or jazz or whatever that might be, or you know, rock and roll, the Beatles, right? Like they are amazing artists and that we, uh, separate that from that we play the saxophone in concert band. Um, we can help them draw those connections together, I think. But yeah, everybody's probably been in some sort of a choir through sixth or seventh grade. They can all read. They can all do math. That's part of their daily lives. But And music is too, but they don't choose to engage it. It's interesting. All of them, all the time. Um, well, early on, my first year, I had a student, middle school student, that couldn't read music, was a constant behavior problem, and I'd done all my steps, and then finally had the conversation with mom, and mom said, he's not leaving, you better figure it out. And then looked at her son and said, you better figure it out, you're not going anywhere. And I, I just couldn't figure out how to get him involved. And then I was in my small rural school and I needed more kids to play pep band because they're either already in the locker room from JV or under the court or they're away because the guys are home and the girls are away or vice versa and we just needed more bodies. So I opened up the pep band book to middle school students as well and this student, that's what he needed. Learned how to read music learned how to count, learned how to play, became a drum major, played bass trombone in the jazz band, right? stayed through music, became a leader, and I learned quickly. I just needed to find the right way into that student's interest. And that was good that that happened right away because every student probably isn't there unless there's something that it brings them joy or interest and you just have to find what it is that's their passion and let them do that. I mean that's like one example of a student that makes me a better teacher but that was early enough yeah and listening to what motivates them and trying to find a way to take that motivation feed it and help expand it right yeah I mean we if we're teachers, I mean, well, yeah, we have to listen to our students. We just have to. Otherwise, you can be a great leader, but if nobody's following you as you're leading, you're just by yourself. And we always need to be relevant and be listening deeply. I, it's easier with... Oh, my daughter takes piano lessons. She's got this great piano teacher. I just sit in the lessons, not at all to say a thing, but to watch how this woman has never said no to my daughter in four years as a piano. You know, my daughter might play the rhythm wrong in this Brahms or Beethoven thing, but she'll always, no, tell me about this measure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, do you like the way you did that or do you like the way Brahms did that? And you know, sometimes she's playing a wrong note because the note sounded wrong to her, right? It's diminished seven or, a, you know, it's, it's a passing tone that moves and my daughter just by ear was correcting as she thought it was an error. I never noticed, right? And then she was, draws her attention to it and she goes, oh, I see, right. So like Beethoven wants to make that line go like that. Isn't that interesting? But she never says, no, 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 that's a B natural. She's never said the word no to my daughter. And the second she finds out she's interested in the piano song, also known as Fear Elise, right? Well, then I'm going to find something that's at your level that engages you and excites you about the piano. And it's so much easier than with a group. But I love watching how she motivates my daughter. And, you know, that makes me say, well, my first lesson with a student, private lesson on the trumpet, why do you want to take trumpet lessons? What do you hope to get out of this? What's your goal? 
Maybe they've not even thought about that, but I want them to. And I want my future teachers, why do you want to be a teacher? What's your goal? I think we need to listen to our students. I think I was lucky because I was j just too stupid to not try again. You know, we have to make a lot of mistakes and I just kept my head down and kept working hard. I didn't know any other way to do that. And I think when I looked up, I was the only one that was still working hard. And I had moved as a teacher and as a musician into a whole new realm of musician and teacher. And that's a long game. It's not months. It's not even a year or two, right? It's a five years. It's a decade of working on being a better teacher every day and also being a better musician. Still playing in community groups that challenge me, taking lessons, going back to school. So if I could go back and talk to myself, I would allow myself more grace to make mistakes and enjoy the process. I just wanted it to be perfect and that's not good enough and how am I going to make it better? So there's a tenacity there that I love, but I also just didn't like myself or maybe wasn't as healthy as I could have been in terms of balance of it's okay. You just, you're not going to solve this before 6 a.m. tomorrow. You're just going to get up and do it again. It'll be fine. But I would, I would stick it out. So I would, I'd give myself more grace to enjoy the ride and allow myself to be okay with not knowing everything right now. I would like to thank Dr. Peter Haberman for sharing his views and thoughtful insights into why music education matters. I hope you enjoyed this program. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming episodes of Music Education, Why It Matters, please hit the subscribe button and click on the bell. Thanks for watching and see ya.